Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice activated sync. Sync gives you versatile access to music, podcasts, and more from just about any device. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, such as The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, go to AudiblePodcast.com slash DragonFrame. Episode 55, I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood's beard, also featuring Brian Brushwood. Hey, it's the tale of two beards today on Frame Rate. <laughs> no, it's the tale of one beard and one really wish one day he'll be a grown man. That's a be- beard. I call it a beard. <laughs> tail on you your face. This? Come on. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Frame Rate, where we talk about beards and the big story. This just in, the big story. Cord cutters, HBO doesn't want you. Get over uh, it. We actually have, if, if we, we could go live, we have this, this coverage right now. HBO is making this statement to cord cutters. HBO co-president Eric Kessler told a gathering of industry scientists in New York, uh, the boffins is what the paid content story says, must be written by a Brit, uh, that there is no chance his company will make shows like True Blood or The Wire available to digital non-subscribers. HBO okay. has about 30 million customers who have to buy the content as an upgrade to their cable or satellite package. Kessler said that despite the success of HBO Go, which is their, their package for watching online, that you have to be a subscriber already to get. The company has no plans to offer a mobile offering to a broad audience. Uh, okay, real quick, real quick. Just uh, the, the, the very first, you mentioned a couple of shows saying whether they would or would not be available. Hit me with that again. What was that quote again? Uh, Kessler said, let me see here. Um, uh, that despite the success of HBO Go, the company has no plans to offer the new mobile offering to a broad audience. Yeah, yeah, but it mentioned two shows. Mentioned two shows, like The Wire. Uh, well, that wasn't a quote, though. That was just paid content. It says there's no chance the company will make shows like True Blood or The Wire available See, to digital non-subscribers. Yeah. That's paid I'm content. Kidding. Don't pick on that because that's not what Kessler said. Because I, I think well, I know where you're going with that. Well, okay, but the point is, is regardless, it's still true. The fact is, is exactly those two shows are available to non-paid subscribers when you buy them on the iTunes store. Yeah, and that's but the, that's not I, what Kessler's saying. Kessler's saying we are not going to make our video available to non-paying subscribers on a streaming basis. HBO goes great, but it's only going to be available to paying subscribers. We can get sidetracked into them making previous episodes available for pay-as-you-go basis, uh, but that's not what he... He wasn't trying to say that... He wasn't trying to contradict that they sell them on iTunes. He's talking specifically about streaming. Well, no, no, no. And, and understand, I'm not saying that, that like we caught them in a lie or anything like that. My point is, is that... Uh, for all this talk about keeping people in the pipeline, the fact is is that there are opportunities for people who don't subscribe to HBO to get the best of the HBO content. And and now granted, obviously, if you want the material within the 24 hours after it came out, if you want it the next day, the way you could get with like The Walking Dead, that kind of thing, certainly they don't want to help you along in that way. But, but meanwhile, like uh, I'm right now out of everything, 
in HBO's catalog, you either have old movies that have already made the rounds on DVD or, you know, on, on pay-per-view, or you have the original content, the vast majority of which in their back catalog is already available either on iTunes or another thing. What you have is a very small, very narrow window of, of highly valued properties that they're only making available through the HBO Go app only to paid subscribers. So it's like, uh, again, this is not a universal like, you know, boxes up cable you know uh, pcs down type thing that they're doing there, there's ways and of course you know and then there's the big looming shadow of of you know the way most people watch it but um uh or, or the way a lot of non-subscribers watch hbo content i all i'm saying is that this is a very sky is falling kind of headline and it's not a sky is falling kind of situation kessler is saying that hbo regards cord cutting as a temporary phenomenon that will go away once the larger economy improves so it Maybe. is a sky is falling headline, but it is apt because what everyone has been saying, we've said it so many times on this show and so many different guests have said it. If HBO would just sell me their service direct, I would give them money, but I right. won't do it if I have to subscribe to cable and then pay on top of that because I don't want to do that. I, 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 I do that personally, but I don't want to have to do that. I want to be able to get it direct. And if they really want to compete with Netflix and Hulu in the future, that's what they're going to have to consider. What Kessler's saying is, no way. That'll never happen. There'll never be a need for that to happen. You're always going to have a cable television package, and you're always going to get HBO that way, and that's the only way we'll ever do it. All right, now here's the disturbing part is he might be 100% right. It might be the type of thing where services like HBO can live in the fat, where it's just that much convenient and that much not worth it to try to find another way to get a hold of this content. And the content's just good enough that it's like, ah, you know what? What's 20 bucks a month? What, what does an HBO subscription cost? And I guess there are probably multiple tiers. It all tiers depends. Yeah, it ranges from 10 to 20. It's somewhere in there, yeah. usually. But, but you know, it's like there's plenty of services. Now, Now, meanwhile, the frustrating thing is that there are entire genres of services that live in the category below the amount of money that uh, that HBO is charging. You take a, a service like, uh, I don't know, Spotify or Mog or one of these things where it's like any music in the whole world that you want to hear anytime you want it, and it's $9 a month, and people howl like it's the end of the world. But meanwhile, you got a service like HBO that essentially plays nothing but old movies and uh, and, and and original content that eventually becomes available for sale uh, separately anyway, and they act like it's the end of the world if they if you know if they can't charge 10 to $20 for it. I mean, it's it's and again, I understand there's a place for curated channels of entertainment, and I understand that HBO is a tremendously valuable brand that's created a lot of good properties. But it's just frustrating to see them sitting sitting on their high horse talking about them lowly cord cutters and how we ain't gonna cotton to them. I I I I think I think it's just myopic, and I think it's HBO speaking directly to their cable partners. I don't think it's them really saying that they believe this is the way it's going because frankly they can't they understand that netflix is competition for them uh but they believe that their best bet is to double down on the current system and ride that as far as it goes and then if they have to change later they can change quickly because they've been doing hbo go so it'll be right. very easy to raise the paywall and or, or actually i guess it'd be put the paywall in a different place put a gate over a different road. I don't know what the metaphor <laughs> appropriately would be, but basically sure. say, all right, HBO Go is now available at this price to anybody, whether you have uh, a cable I, I subscription or not. But to say but to say that we believe cord cutting is a phenomenon that will go away when the economy approves, uh, that, that's just not recognizing the reality of what's happening. I think that's the part that annoys me. You absolutely nailed it. It's the fact that they got up on a podium and they pretended like they were talking to us. They said something that's completely disingenuous that they clearly are, don't cannot believe on the inside. And they were definitely speaking to their shareholders and to their other partners. Uh, it was it, this is this is probably one of the douchier things I've seen come out of, of the mouth of an HBO representative. Now, the UBS media conference in New York, Jeff Books, who's the Time Warner CEO, uh, said that HBO Go users watch 30 to 50 percent more content on HBO than non-HBO Go users. However, they don't seem to have contributed to a rise in subscribers. Well, and, and that's and exactly what HBO Go is for. HBO uses HBO Go, Go as a retention module, not as a way to get new subscribers. Right, correct. And, uh, and, and that's fine. And that is what it is. And there's actually a number of things I want to say about this, but there's some stories that I'm afraid we're going to run out of time for. So I don't mind just shutting up for now. Well, we can keep talking about Jeff Books because he is another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. 
Jeff Books talks about Netflix a lot. Uh, it's one of those, doth he protest too much when he says that Netflix is not a problem for his industry, HBO and Time Warner and others. Uh, he has compared them to the Albanian army in the past. Okay. Uh, he that's, has called them a hamburger. When, you uh, know, that's, that's a perfectly, uh, perfectly fair choice when you're, you could either get fine dining or you can get a hamburger. Netflix is I, the I once called them a banana taco, but I'm, I, was, I was drunk. Yeah, yeah. And I said um, today, he said, Netflix is our friend. <laughs> By the way, I eventually reconciled with the banana taco, and, and we are now friends as well. The Time Warner CEO made the remark at the, uh, at the UBS Media uh, event that I was talking about. Uh, he said that uh, he doesn't want to play down the threat posed by cord cutters, uh, but he says that it's only a small number of low-income people who are ceasing to pay TV, so they're still out there hammering uh, that. Is, but, is that, is that. Does that strike you as, as a little bit of an offensive thing to say? I don't know what it is about me, uh, about that phrase that just makes me think, I don't know, it just bristles me. They'll be like, oh, but that's just the lower income people. I, and I'm sure that's not what they meant by it, but there's something about it that really irks me. Well, I think, you know, I think what they're, it, it, taken out of context, it can sound really insulting. They're talking about it de as a demographic line, not as people. So they're saying, we're seeing subscribership disappear in this line of, of people, and it happens to be the lower income line. Uh, so you can try to get all PC and come up with a nicer term for it, but it basically means people who make less than a certain amount of money uh, are the ones that are canceling the account. And I think that makes sense. Well, I, I know, but, but, but again, it's like, I think what's offensive to me is the dismissal of whatever, whatever message may have been inherent. You know, we talk about the invisible hand of, of the economy, of the market driving forces, and it's as though, you know, you could kind of brush it off. You're like, oh, that's just dandruff talking. I hear what they're saying, but it's just so small and so insignificant. Let me flick that off my, my shoulder and get back to counting my Benjamins. That, I think that's what I don't like about it. Yeah, and, and Books said the monetization strategy is simple. It's the one we all love and the one we've used for years, explaining that carriage fees and a broad subscription base would continue to be the enormous driver of profits that they have been for years. And again, this shows that what these guys are counting on is that things aren't going to change much soon. And right now, they can look at their numbers and take comfort that that's true. Right this second, things aren't changing much. People are keeping their subscriptions to cable for the most part, except if they're in, you know, economic hardship. But in those cases, they're canceling it because the economy's bad. So if the economy recovers, presumably they would get those people back. Uh, they're also not seeing an enormous number of people using online services. So in a way, they're, they're, they're approaching this better than the music industry did, which Napster was used by a much smaller percentage of the music buying public at the time, and the right. RIAA freaked out about it. So they right. may be comforting themselves saying, hey, we're not going to freak out about this Netflix stuff. We're just going to, you know, stay the course, keep going with the monetization strategy, that very simple carriage fee strategy, which is not simple at all. But that shows that they don't know the tsunami that's coming out there. They don't see the big wave that is going to, going to take them out. Now, I don't know that it's going to take them out this year. I don't even think it's going to take them out next year. But it's coming. And if you're not, if you're not strategizing against it, if you're not positioning yourself against it, it's going to hit, and all of a sudden you're going to say, what the hell happened? Why did I lose 50% of my subscribers suddenly? Okay, but here here is the race, okay? There's 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 one thing I do absolutely agree. There is an absolute groundswell of frustration with the way traditional media is working. This one size fits all package where we have to pay an outrageous amount of money to get to get 999 channels that we won't watch and one that we tune into maybe two or three hours a day. There's definitely a tsunami of frustration and anger, but there was also a tsunami of frustration and anger against, you know, we'll say the, the TSA's body scanners that there was. And then when they motivated something, the opt-out day it ended up fizzling because they were they were outmaneuvered by the fact that at half the airports they just shut down the machines or whatever will this tsunami get outmaneuvered by le uh, number one from the legal standpoint and number two from the fact that maybe there's no legal uh, alternative for people to go to and the uh, the difficulty of of learning piracy from their 17 year old kid prevents them from actually going forward I mean if you're and again the show Clearly, we have no problem speculating about where this is headed. I actually, sadly, think that the legal maneuvering is going to keep a lot of this at bay. I think a lot of the demonization of piracy is going to keep a lot of this at bay. And I wouldn't be surprised if the groundswell never really happens. And instead, we get some kind of lukewarm 
half-assed offering from the cable companies. We just get a, a, a splash of bath water instead of a tsunami? Exactly. The warm bath water of well, 2012, it'll be called. Here's where their hope is, if I can, if I can look at it that way. Uh, their hope is that the constant pressure for stronger copyright law will give them leverage over all the competition. Because let's, let's face it, stronger pressure for copyright law is only partially about stopping counterfeiters and copyright infringement. It's also right. about having leverage in the marketplace to chill other people from trying innovative business models. The, the congressman will never uh, cop to that. But you know the industry considers that a very happy side effect of stronger copyright law. They also look at their, their own ISPs that they own and the bandwidth caps that they're putting in place uh, that if they can get away with that, if they can keep the FCC from putting any kind of regulation that keeps them from, uh, from looking any competitive, that then they can slow down adoption of industries like Netflix and, and Hulu because people will be worried, whether they have to or not, they'll be worried about going over their bandwidth caps or they'll be worried about adopting these things. And then if they can continually slam the other industries from getting, or prevent, I should say, slam the door, uh, from getting the content that would build a groundswell, then those industries will never come up with enough money to actually go and compete directly. We'll talk about Netflix in a second here, but that situation, while right now looking possible, has never played out that way. You always have some disruptive force that comes in and says, you know what? I see the weakness here because the consumer doesn't want it that way. Now, the question is, will it last for one year, five years, ten years? If it lasts for ten years, then they, they could profit out of this, and they may be able to call themselves right. But if somebody comes along, like Netflix is already there, uh, if Light Squared is able to provide high bandwidth connections without a, uh, uh, without a cap, uh, if, if FCC regulations are able to persist uh, and, and prevent bandwidth caps from being abused uh, to prevent competition... It, there's so many things that favor the consumer. The consumer always wins in the end. Right. That's, that's the lesson. If you look back at VHS Betamax, if you look back at the fight between broadcasters and cable, who didn't want cable anywhere near a television, if you look back through the history, the consumers can be put off for a while. And in AT&T's case, they put them out for about 70 years. Right. But in the end, the consumer device, the consumer uh, uh, taste always prevails you just can't fight it for long and i gotta give i gotta give full credit to uh the fantastic uh, andrew main science fiction author and magician uh, illusionist extraordinaire uh he he put it to me in a way that kind of blew my mind because i get really bent out of shape about oh now there's this law shutting down this now they're using unfair advantages to shut down competition in this sector and and he told me that uh, that you know it's it technology outpaces legislation and as a result you end up with more freedom over the long term and uh it, i didn't even see that until i saw for example i don't know if i've already mentioned this on the show before but you know uh cato institute had this whole lecture talking about preparing for legislation for cars that drive themselves they're not looking lawmakers are not looking at this issue like a 10 year out or 20 year out issue they're saying we need to start writing the laws five years from now because because all of a sudden drunk driving can be irrelevant when, what, what does it mean to drive a car when the car is driving itself? Google has these automobiles. Technology outpaces, and even though there's so many laws about whether you could drink or drive, suddenly it's irrelevant because your car is driving it itself, and you're getting home safely. Same thing for your eyesight's bad, and you're 95 years old. Your car's still driving it. So technology outpaces law, and that's something that gives me hope when it comes to the legal wrangling that we see with these kind of issues. All right, let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Now, I, I, this was actually supposed to be just another big story, but I turned Netflix being Time Warner's friend into a separate story. Uh, Netflix, however, uh, planning uh, to, to accept a world of competitors. This was uh, Reed Hastings talking about at the UBS conference. He said lots of stuff about how they were like Bank of America and they screwed up. Uh, by changing things and, and having outrage, and that, but that they'll survive and it'll all, it'll all settle down. He, comp he said they've got a money ball strategy uh, to win in this content war, which means he sees himself as the Oakland A's against Time Warner's New York Yankees in trying to win. By the way, the A's have been in last place quite a bit the last few years. <laughs> uh, so 
He, he's out there trying to convince people Netflix is still a going uh, concern. Meanwhile, Verizon announces a very limited Netflix competitor. Uh, Verizon says that outside of their Fios markets, so they're going to block anybody who lives in a Fios market, outside of their Fios market, they intend to launch, or at least Reuters says they intend to launch, it's not official, a service that would provide maybe some movies like, like an Epics service or a Stars Direct service. Maybe some television shows like a kid's service. Very limited service. And Netflix stock goes down. Okay, well, first of all, that, that surprises me. And it doesn't surprise me in that, in that you know, a stock is a reflection of perception. And on the surface, you're like, oh, Netflix or Verizon's getting into the Netflix game. That's trouble. But the problem is, is, is Verizon has a tremendous branding issue. And you see it right there in the very beginning thing where it says it won't even be available to people who have Fios. But it'll be, I guess, Verizon branded or some some kind of Verizon FiOS related name. No, but you know, I don't think it'll be FiOS related. It's just going to be Verizon providing this service that you can then. Basically, what they're saying is, we have all these relationships with channels on Verizon FiOS cable, and we don't want to threaten those relationships. So outside of the Verizon FiOS market, we're going to launch the streaming service. But we promise to our programmers that we won't launch it in the areas where we're carrying their programming so that it won't compete with them there. Now, is there a reason they couldn't just have announced their own version of Hulu saying, hey, we, we're putting forth the money, we're creating this new brand, this new thing, it's going to be a competitor to Netflix. It seems like a hedge to, to make it a Verizon-related announcement. Well, it's to, not, let's be clear, it's not an announcement. It's Reuters reporting a rumor. Okay. Well, all right. Well, okay. Well, well, then maybe that's what it is. Maybe they will do the smart thing. But let me let me implore you guys: do not fall into the trap of thinking that you can bank on the Verizon mega brand and have that work in the small term. Especially if you're going to split between where the service is available or not, based on on what your own coverage is. That does not end up well. Yeah, this isn't Verizon Wireless either. This is Verizon, the phone right. company. Uh, this is the Verizon that actually provides cable television service over internet fiber. Uh, so it's kind of hard to keep track of what's going on here. But think of them like a cable provider. It would be as if Comcast said, we're going to provide a, a video streaming service that does some movies and maybe some kids shows in areas where Comcast isn't available. Right. Correct. So it's a way of like, we're going to try to collect some money from people who can't pay, pay us otherwise. Oh, I see. Uh, now, but, but I think the point of this is that Netflix stock went down based on this, which is very limited, very limited threat. But you have things like on CNET, uh, there's a report that uh, analysts are saying Netflix is, is broken with no no solution in sight. Uh, Wedbush okay, analyst now, Michael Packer said edition. this. This was a late addition to the big story, so I did not get the chance to read this article. Fill me in on this. Pactor said that Netflix is broken in its decision earlier this year to raise prices uh, uh, who, uh, for, on customers who wanted both DVDs and streaming uh, proved to be a catalyst that brought flaws to light. Uh, he's, here's the quote. It is clear that a price increase was necessary and equally clear in hindsight that a 60% increase on a hybrid customer was too much. While we think that the company would have seen some customer defections and trade downs at any price point, it is clear to us that the defections and trade downs would have been less dramatic had the price increase been smaller. Okay, well that's fair enough. But the damage is done, according to Pactor, and by year's end, Netflix will show a loss of 11 million hybrid customers that previously rented DVDs and streamed video content. He said he believes 7 million of those customers will have traded down to streaming only, while another 4 million will have quit Netflix altogether. So it's a little exaggerated there. They're only losing 4 million customers. And remember, Netflix doesn't care if you leave the DVD business. They want you to go to streaming only at this point. So so try this on for size. Try this. Uh, granted, it was a huge mishandling of, of their perception of, of what they thought people would accept and go for. It, it was a PR disaster. But at the end of the day, the, the, the whole move was motivated by the fact that we don't want to shove coasters around anymore. What we want to do is stream movies over the Internet. And although it's been a very ugly implementation are, are we not kind of at the point where, where Netflix has gotten what they wanted out of this whole disaster to begin with? For example, earlier, um, uh, we'll talk about it and what, what we're watching, but Spaced is now on Netflix and instant streaming. And when I tweeted it, I, I was like, it's on Netflix. And I'm like, I'm not going to call it Netflix instant streaming anymore. Because in my heart, in my mind, Netflix is one thing, and that's watching movies wirelessly on my iPad, iPhone, all that crap. But Pac what Pactor points out, his ultimate point is, because of the loss of these subscribers and because of the change in revenue, uh, they are probably going to lose around $18 million next year, but says that's conservative. It could rise up to $100 million. So 
if they lose all that money, how are they going to have the cash to continue to acquire content as content gets more and more expensive? Uh, he, he thinks they're just they're not going to make back the subscribers that they've lost, and they're going to keep bleeding money. That's going to cause the stock price to crash. That's going to cause it to be harder for them to get funding uh, and, and harder for them to justify to the board spending money on things that they need to spend money on. It's just going to be bad news in 2012 for Netflix. I think Netflix is banking their entire future on 2013 when they get those original programs going that those original programs are going to be hits and that people are going to start talking to each other and saying hey you've got to watch this crime drama you've got to watch this this new political thriller on netflix you've got to pay the eight dollars a month it's totally worth it that may or may not pay off for them but now it has to pay off for them or the the company faces real serious problems uh agreed a hundred percent i don't know I, I don't know whether or not they'll, I mean, 2012 is going to be a very long year, and how we feel about Netflix now may not be how we feel about it then. I well, know think that, of, that. I think of how you felt about Netflix a year ago, most people, compared to now. I don't know. To be honest, I don't feel all that different. But then again, I'm, I'm certainly but not. But a lot of say, people do. Yes, exactly. And and I will agree that I'm not I'm not speaking for everyone, but I will say that uh, that I'm still optimistic. And I think hopefully a year from now, uh, on behalf of my enthusiasm for what Netflix has done for on demand content, I hope that a year from now we perceive them as a network and not as a DVD or as a movie supplying company. I won't even go that far. I'll say I hope for a year from now that they're solvent. I hope that they have enough money. No, sir, I'm serious. The way this Pactor guy's talking, you know, they, they could be running into trouble where they, they might they could have a hit in let's let's say they have a hit in House of Cards and not be able to afford the second season. They could get yeah. in that kind of trouble where the strategy pays off but it pays well, off too late. And and there's plenty of of opportunity. Or there's plenty of historical precedent for this kind of thing. Like what are the early? I forget the brand of the very first uh, television set, but they didn't last long. Uh, like like an RCA or, or certainly RCA or Zenith were early television pioneers, but they just weren't able to hold on to it, and they got outdone by by better, faster, cheaper alternatives. And nowadays, when's the last time you bought an RCA or a Zenith television? Great Zenith growing up, I loved it. They're, they're saying Baird in the chat room. I don't know if that's a brand name or not. No, they're saying you're you're you've been bared. You've, I've been bared. It's like I've it's bared a, my soul before you've bared I you. your soul. All right, let's take a quick break and uh, Dumont, thank Dumont. our sponsor, okay. Ford, featuring voice activated sync uh, with Sync's entertainment features. You can access music and podcasts from most devices, including iPods, mobile phones, tablets, or even just flash drives. Put all your music on there, plug it in. Uh, sync with my Ford Touch. You can play videos, display photos from your digital camera or your portable game device. When your vehicle is in park, you can play the games anyway. It's all made possible through a versatile media hub, which supports a convenient variety of devices for your music and entertainment, such as wired connections from just about any device through USB ports, SD slots, RCA jacks, wireless access via Bluetooth. Basically, you've got a thing that can play the music and the entertainment. It'll work with your Ford. Uh, just connect your device and play. Once your device is connected, you can use the voice activation to say, play genre jazz. Uh, play the Wu-Tang Clan. And it'll just do it. Uh, those are, by the way, Wu-Tang Clan quite a diverse selection is not you jazz. Have there. Uh, you can even say play track song titles. Also available is Sync with My Ford Touch HD Radio featuring iTunes tagging. So you're listening to HD Radio. You're like, I love this song. I want to buy it. It'll tag it so you can buy it on iTunes. Pretty amazing. Purchase the song directly. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to life at Ford.com slash technology. And we thank them for their support. Let's By the way, on. I will say this about... I will say this about the Ford Motor Company. They are a perfect example of somebody who was not actually first. In fact, the first... Uh, Gasoline-powered commercial car manufacturers were Charles and Frank Duryea. But you know what? When's the last time you bought yourself a Duryea? It's innovation that keeps things going. You could uh, re learn more about that on Tech History Today. Let's move on to Film Fact. Love Film is getting out of the Flash business. This is actually bad news for Flash. It probably doesn't mean anything for those of you who, who use Love Film, though. Uh, Love Film is going to switch to Silverlight for their streaming movies uh, because it's more DRM friendly. Now, how big a deal is this? Because I don't know. to me, I mean, I sit on the sidelines for this kind of thing, and all I hear is that you know they're winding down. I, I know that Flash support is eliminated, eliminated for mobile, and they're winding it down probably for desktop. But but isn't Silverlight support being wound down as well or, or ended? 
I, well, yes. I mean, a lot of people suspect, suspect that. Microsoft won't say yay or nay on that. They, they've said some things that imply that Silverlight is going to decline in support, but they're far from getting rid of it. What, uh, what I think is interesting is Love Films talking about HTML5, right? That's what everybody thinks you're, you should move to in these situations. Love Film called HTML5 an open source solution that is still maturing with no services that will allow us to stream content securely. In other words, HTML5, because it's open, it's not open source. It's an open standard. It's not right. an approved standard yet. Doesn't have any DRM built into it. That's going to keep them from using it for now because Silverlight has it. Uh, but anyway. But, but, this is, but that's such a silly thing to say because what does it take to put a DRM wrapper around it that's supported as a plug-in on your Chrome or, what, or any of these other browsers? I don't understand. Plus, the biggest problem is Flash was supported on Linux. Silverlight's not. So if, oh, you, if you're a Linux snap. user in the UK, forget it. You're not using Love Film after January. Yeah, well, well done. It's all over for you. Uh, also, uh, Stephen Moffat, who is the executive producer of Doctor Who, has differed uh, with, what's his name, Yates, the guy, uh, David Yates, who had said yeah, yeah, okay. that he so, was so working on a Doctor Who movie. Now, and keep in mind, what is it? This, this is one of those things that you have to kind of cast a sharp light on to. Somebody who has written a successful property can legitimately and, awesomely and honestly say, uh, you know, I wrote, the, I wrote Ghostbusters, and now I'm writing Time Traveler 85, The Revenge of Nation. Uh, and that is a factually accurate thing. But then you know, things get blown up. And they're like, they're making Time Traveler 85, The Revenge of Nation. Um, is, is this a case where somebody... Is, is developing it, meaning he's at home just typing in out some ideas on a on a keyboard, and then that then finally the director, executive producer of the property is like, uh, don't go around saying that. Stop that. Uh, well, no, Yates has said that he's actually looking for uh, for writers uh, that he's working on the project. This is far from him saying like, yeah, I'm kind of noodling around with the idea of writing a Doctor Who movie someday. He you know, he he said like, yeah, we're we're working on it. Um, and and Yates, he told Variety that he was developing the movie with Jane Tranter, head of BBC Worldwide Productions, and they were looking for writers. Moffat said, well, it's a little premature. He was talking off the cuff. Uh, there simply are no developed plans for a Doctor Who movie at the moment. Uh, it's an incredibly exciting idea, uh, but when it's done, it will need to star the television's Doctor Who and there's only ever one of those at a time. So this idea that Yates would make a movie that didn't include the current television series and was, was like on a separate reality track and not canon, uh, Moffat doesn't allow. What I think this means, reading the tea leaves, because he says there simply are no developed plans for Doctor Who. Yates says, I am developing the movie. I think Yates is talking to BBC about making a movie and has like a J.J. Abrams-like pitch. Let me reboot it. Let me do it in a different way. And they're listening. And Moffat's over there going, oh, hell no. You're not doing that. Right. Uh, if we do okay. a movie, Yates can do a movie. That's great. But it's going to star Matt Smith or whoever happens to be the Doctor Who at the time. That, uh, it seems to me like they're sort of in the, um, the Star Trek cycle somewhere near the end of Deep Space Nine, but before Voyager. Like right around Voyager, people were like, is this too much Star Trek? Are we too much in... Like, uh, like, because I'll tell you right now, Doctor Who's popularity is the greatest I've ever seen in my entire lifetime. And I've been somebody who dug Doctor Who since second grade watching it on PBS with my dad. Uh, but it's so overexposed now that I wonder if... Really? Every, you think it's overexposed? Uh, dude, I, walk around Dragon Con. Look how many doctors you got and, and Doctor Who related uh, people you have. Yeah, it's but the, the problem ever. with... I take issue with that. The problem with Star Trek was that they actually were making too many new series and they didn't do Next Generation anymore. Uh, the Doctor Who, this is this is the main property, and they've done a couple of spin-offs like Sarah Jane and, and Torchwood, uh, but those aren't really seen as dependent anymore. Uh, well, Sarah Jane is gone, actually, sadly, but uh, Torchwood how, is how not long? seen as dependent on Doctor Who. Doctor Who is barreling ahead, and, and they, they're hoping to build the audience in the U.S. They, they feel it's far from as popular way, as it can be here. First of all, thank you for not counting the K-9 movie as one of those, the made-for-TV K-9 movie. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, as far as, like, when, when did they when did they restart the the Doctor Who series? 2003? Was that about it? Uh, yeah, I don't want to say for sure now because the math is too hard. But, yeah, that's that's roughly right. They're in the okay, season that six. that means we're coming up on nine years into it. There aren't a lot seven, of... Season seven is that... the one coming up. Okay, but but there aren't uh, 2005. Okay, then that, in that case, we're seven years in. There aren't a lot of shows that retain their full 
force at this point. This is around the time point where they start looking at ways to cash in and they start to assume they're immortal. And then I, I'm going to say, this is my prediction. My prediction is that we are beginning the Doctor Who television decline and that what looks like an outrageous idea right now of rebooting the franchise in three years will not look so outrageous. That's my only prediction. I find your thesis evil. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a matter of numbers. It's 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 highly unlikely that you're going to have a but series. But the original Doctor Who ran for 30 freaking years, dude. What's that? The original Doctor Who ran for 30 years. That's right. It started off as a kid's serial and was crap and then got good, and then it dropped off and disappeared for a very long time. And now Also, I, 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 this is a very good point. Who made this? I want to give them credit. It's, it's, P. Delahanty points out they reboot Doctor Who every time there's a new Doctor. It's built into uh, okay. the, the, the mythos. Uh, they change the lead actor. And how many other shows? Do you that obviously work? don't watch else. the series. Uh, okay, first of all, I have. I watched all the way up through. I watched all the old series. I watched all the new ones. And that's and I'm the one who's not emotionally attached to it. I'm saying, statistically speaking, I understand. Yes, you refresh interest every time by replacing the lead actor. But as long as the as as the style and themes are similar and the same. There are very few properties. Everything is cyclical. cyclical. It goes up and it goes down, including Doctor Who has gone up and gone down. Yeah, and but you're you talking about instead of up and down, it's going to go up and then it's going to go away and it'll have to be no, rebooted on no, a movie. I'm not saying that. I'm saying enthusiasm will go up and down as it has for the last 40 or 50 years, however freaking long they've been doing it. And you guys saying like we're up here now and that the stock market shall rise forever. No, that's not got, what I'm saying. It's not going to happen in the next three years. No, all I'm saying is that it's not going to crash in the next few years it's going to maintain uh, okay. and they I, I won't need we, and the fans won't a, accept that reboot unless it's handled really carefully okay who who talked about a crash i said that that interest will wane and that uh, uh, the out, as outrageous as the idea of a reboot looks now it will not look outrageous three years from now well, that was I, my that's point. my fault for misinterpreting you because you compared it to star trek which crashed and went away before jj abrams was allowed to come okay, along again, again, and so i was well, using like, that as the parallel Okay, all right, all right. So, so here's the thing. I'm, I'm saying shows do this. I'm making my hand go in an up and down motion like a sine wave. You define a crash as wherever insolvency is. So, so star, you know, star Trek did the it dipped down below the solvency line and came back up, right? No, no, but no. no. Star is, Trek did this. It did this for a while, and then it did Enterprise, and then it did that. Then it went on to the ground. There was no Star Trek until J.J. Abrams right. came along and rebooted just it. Like there was, just like there was no Star Trek in the early 70s. and Because right. it was gone, and then they brought it back with the movies, and it enjoyed another rise and fall. Well, and then that's my back. issue. I don't think Doctor Who's going to do that. Yeah, okay. I, you're the one talking about, I never mentioned insolvency or crashing. I said, Then why are you using Star Trek? As the, okay, you, you've lost me. You've entirely lost me. Ugh. I, if your point, if your point is that Doctor Who won't, you know, continually rise for the next foreseeable future, I agree with you. If your point is that maybe it will be on a little bit of a down curve and the idea of a big movie uh, that maybe changes and messes around with things uh, might be seen f uh, more favorably than it is right now, I agree with you. I, I'm pretty sure you just said back my exact words okay, and acted like they were your idea. I'm glad you like my idea. Let's move <laughs> on to the Empire Strikes Back storyboards. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Battle of Hoth, the grandest battle of the original Star Wars trilogy. IO9 has a, uh, a, a, a story where they're showing off uh, some of the original storyboards, and they're just gorgeous. That's the only reason I brought it up. Uh, by the way, I'm surprised. I went through, I ended up, I thought I'd just look at the first two or three of these, but I was surprised at how much as I went through it, I saw the, the re, I, you know, of course, saw not only the movie in my mind, but I felt what I felt for the movie in there. And, and uh, it was really inspiring. I, I was surprised at how much these, uh, these, these kind of crudely drawn sketches really. Uh, it just really makes you hear the sound effects, at least for me. I hear and like. More it, it takes me to a place where, where what must it have been like to be in these meetings and to have this group idea slowly evolve when they see the, the concept art and moving forward. I mean, it was, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really precious. You should check these out. Uh, finally, let's check in on the NSFW show frame rate joint effort winner movie draft. Boy, essentially nothing. I mean... Like theoretically, Tom, you could you could brag that that your movie was number one again, 
but but his whole take for the weekend was what sixteen million dollars. This was the slowest weekend in eight months. Yeah, the weekend after Thanksgiving is probably going to be slow, just because people are you know kind of going back to work, doing shopping. They're 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 not going to be taking a weekend to go hang out at the movies until it gets closer to Christmas or after Christmas. Uh, sadly, uh, I, I have no internet. I've been faking it this entire show, so I can't see. The NSFW show draft numbers per se, but well, I'm still here, behind you. All right. Oh yeah, there we go. Thank you, Jason. Uh, uh, yeah, much to my shock and amazement, uh, I'm still barely holding on to number one. I've got 329, and you've got 248, but you still have two thirds of all your movies left to have come out. Right? You've got Alvin and well, the Chip. Yes, Chip two of my three movies. <laughs> Uh, like, that is exactly two thirds. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> well, that's 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 why I selected my fractions carefully, sir. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, it's but, just sad that I only have three. If you, J Jason, if you could pan over to the other side, I want to see what's coming out this week. Uh, yeah. Not. That. I'll, I'll tell you what, Tom. <laughs> I actually think you're gonna. <laughs> I, I really do think you're going to run away with this one because the sitter's not going to make a ton of money for Justin. Um, is that uh, what's coming out this week? Yeah, The Sitter and uh, New Year's Eve for Glenn. I don't think either of those are going to make I a lot of money. I think New Year's Eve will do okay, but neither one of those are going to uh, launch them. Justin is the closest to me, uh, and he would need to have a huge take from The Sitter. So, you know, the person I'm really worried about is Girl with Dragon Tattoo, Mission Impossible from Sarah Lane. I need Alvin and the Chipmunks, which is still okay. two weeks away. I want you to, to think of it huge. this way, Tom. Will Girl with the Dragon Tattoo outperform Breaking Dawn Part 1? No. Okay, so you don't have to worry about her beating you on that one. Will Mission Impossible beat all your other movies? Your uh, Alvin and oh, the you're Chipmunks. right. You know what? I, I don't need to worry about Sarah as much as I need to worry about you. No, I've got nothing left. You're in I'm out front of, of me. Well, yeah, and dude, if you're Alvin and Tintin both tank, you'll stay gonna... in front of me. Okay, okay. Because but here's you're, the thing. you are 80 million in front. If they both do less than 40, you win. There's no way Adventures of Tintin plus... Chipmunks makes less than eighty million dollars. There's no you got this thing. In fact, I'll make you a side bet where I'll <laughs> I'll send you an Omaha. Are you shorting steak. yourself? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Sell your stock in Brian Brushwood. He's going down in flames. This thing's host. In fact, I'm going to start speculating in the chat realm market. Where right now with uh, five hundred and fifty-five million dollars, I Sam U Dyson five is currently in number one. So now here's so so anyway, I I know you pointed out that it's probably really difficult for Sarah to catch me with Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but just to add to the issue. Uh, let's do our sponsor now. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Audible. Audible, the internet leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. I'm listening to 1Q84 right now. It's fantastic. Uh, they play on your iPhone, your iPod, your Android device, or your Kindle. Yeah, because they're audio I, uh... files and you can play them on your Kindle. There's a special offer just for Frame Rate listeners. Download the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo audiobook free today when you try Audible. Free download, Girl with the Dragon tattoo, tattoo, for 30 days. Uh, you'll find all three books in Stig Larson's uh, Millennium Trilogy on Audible, all read by award-winning narrator Simon Vance. Hear it before you see the movie, or even better, just don't bother seeing the movie. Uh, in theaters December 21st, okay, go see the movie. You should, you should see the movie, too. I'm, I'm not going to be greedy, but hear the book. Get the book done before you go see the movie. It's in the theaters December 21st. Download your free copy of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or any audiobook of your choice at audiblepodcast.com slash dragon frame. That's audiblepodcast.com slash dragon frame. Uh, great idea. Great thing to do. And uh, Vance does a great uh, job. I've, uh, I've listened to this. It's, it's fantastic. Simon Vance is a great narrator. So check it out. Audiblepodcast.com slash dragon frame for a free audiobook, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Pick it up. Let's move I, uh, on. By the way, oh, real yeah. quick, on, on Audible, uh, I, I do want to say that, that you and I need to have some kind of spoiler zone discussion about 1Q84 because I finished it today and, and uh, most of my thoughts were related to the similarities and differences between 1Q84 versus uh, uh, the Dark Tower universe. Nah. And, and you, are, you are one of like five people in my whole world that I could have <laughs> the conversation I want to have about this. Oh, I'm not quite halfway through, so you need to give me some time. No, no, I'll give you a, uh, like a day, like eight years. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, <laughs> it's pretty long. All right, let's move on to Tube Tops. <laughs> Fanhattan is starting to look like a possible uh, contender for that service that we all want that says, you want to watch this movie or TV show? Here's where you can find it online. They just added, uh, they've, they've already had Netflix, Hulu Plus, iTunes, Vudu, and oddly, ABC.com. But starting today, Fanhattan has added content from PBS, 
Crackle, and Lifetime. Have you used the Manhattan Act? You know, I used it uh, when it first came out, and I really like the interface, but I didn't keep using it because it doesn't have enough of the sources. And, and I find that things like Clicker work better at finding things, uh, or Side Reel. Side Reel works really well as well. Now, I'll tell you this much. Uh, on the surface, you mentioned the, those are not obviously AAA most popular pr uh, franchises. Uh, P what was it? PBS Crackle and Lifetime. Uh, but the PBS alone, realize that's a bunch of, that's a whole bunch of Nova. And I've started watching the Nova pod, uh, episodes on uh, uh, Netflix Instant Streaming. And it's like, what an amazing wealth of fantastic material they have. Also, the BBC is bringing the iPlayer and iPad app to Canada. This is the global iPlayer and iPad app. So just so close, right over the border. And Canadians, here we go again. Another example, you get something first. You can watch Doctor Who right now on the iPlayer on your iPad. Can I, can I tell you that this makes me, seeing this story, I felt something in my heart that makes me have to completely retract a position I had early on. I think early on we were talking about the idea like, so what if all these different stations have their own app? What's the difference between that and just flipping between different channels? But like, dang it, it sucks to leave an app and open another app and wait for it to load and then see what that offering is. Like uh, just seeing, I mean, again, I know the BBC has fantastic content and I'm sure it'll be a fantastic app, but... But I felt something in me that I didn't expect, and now I'm on team. Guys, get it together. Just give me one app to rule them all. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, if I have a really good side reel or clicker that'll just launch the app for me, then that would replace it, right? If Fanhattan were that thing that's like, yeah, whatever you want, every app that's out there for video streaming, we've got it logged, so you just tell us what you want to play, and then we'll launch that app, then I'd be fine with it. But I'm like you. I need that one place to go to manage it all. And if it has to do some chicanery on the background to play it, fine, whatever. Yeah, and, and the difference is, is I don't know what kind of, uh, you know, obviously we're accustomed to, for example, for instant messenger, you can use your trillion to handle your MSN, your AIMs, and all your other you know, ways of communicating by text messages. Uh, but, but I don't know that we're able to do that with apps because obviously... Um, especially in iOS, the way it switches between apps, you can't run one that's secretly running five different apps underneath it at the same time. Now, this next story could, could have been a big story on another day. Uh, in light of all of the apps that are coming to televisions, for instance, Samsung TVs will have a thousand apps by year's end. There's a rumor going around today that Apple TV, the, the actual Apple television, uh, will be a pretty expensive television that's main uh, attraction is that you can talk to it. It'll have Siri and you can just say, play this and it'll be connected to the internet and, and, and integrated into the iTunes universe. Uh, paid content is an interesting story saying maybe televisions will go the other way. They'll become dumber. They don't need to be smart. Uh, this was according to Will Stevens, uh, Boxy's SVP of International Business Development at the C21 Future Media Conference in London. We believe the TV might become dumb TV, just a very good screen. Uh, it's possible in an alternate reality, TV just becomes a rendering device. The master control panel moves to the second screen. So this is the universe that you want, Brian, where well, your television yeah, but... is actually just a really good television, and you pick the box that connects to it. Okay, well, and keep in mind, I, I, take, I, I take umbrage to the way you represented that story. Like, yeah, man, we all want TVs that we could talk to. No, and no, no, I'm not saying we all want. Awesome. I'm saying the manufacturers want. When I say, well, I, I didn't mean to imply that that's what everybody wants. I'm implying that the manufacturers are all falling all over themselves to deliver TVs with apps. And right. these guys but, are but, saying, but is, you know what, the, the trend is, may change. My, my point is, is not that the consumer won't get these awesome things. In fact, that's the great land rush of the next five to ten years will be the artificial intelligence stuff because Siri has shown us the promise and that it can work and that all she needs is a vocabulary, a personality, and the ability to parse uh, the more difficult aspects of human language. That will be the greatest land rush of whatever, whatever company can crack that code in the next four to five years, and, and there's no easy fix to it. It's just going to take a ridiculous amount of resources to build up the natural language capability to make it happen. Those guys are going to make a freaking mint, and I want that brought to my television. That's part of what I'm excited about with the Xbox offering that's coming out here soon. My position for the beginning, has, though, has been I want all these things. I want them to reside in a brain. I don't want a piece of this brain in the hands of the television set. The television well, I, thought, set I thought that's what I was setting it up to say, which is all of that stuff has to live outside of the television. That's Correct. what these guys are saying. Is that not what you believe? 
I no no no. I agree. I okay. I do I do agree. I do agree. It's just that uh, you set up this 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 utopic image and then you took it away, saying, or maybe TVs will be dumb like Brian wants. <laughs> that is Brian. not what I was doing. I think you're being a little sensitive now since I I I uh, I stole your your position on Doctor Who. Um, yeah. Now we have to fight for the rest of the show from now on. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I because I think what these guys are saying is. Maybe maybe the future is is not in adding a bunch of apps, and I and I think that's what you're saying is like don't add apps to the television, right? Add them to the box. In other words, you're if I could be, uh, interpret, I sound like Justin Robert Young suddenly. If I can uh, interpret <laughs> what you're saying, um, you want Apple to continue to develop the Apple TV and make that Siri enabled and have all of that goodness. Don't put it in an actual television. Yeah, I wish I and I think that's what I really wanted the Apple TV to be and it just never was. It was clear they were never putting the resources behind it. The, the fact that the revised improved edition was a scaled down version of the original one that didn't even keep any content locally. Um I, I most likely they will put resources into throwing things into the box, but but again, as you pointed out, and I'm actually inspired by your comment earlier that in the long term the consumers win because if it, if it's what we want, then we'll buy it. And if it's not what we want, well then we'll sit back and then eventually they'll figure it out. Now the caveat to that is Apple always does what the consumers say they don't want, and then the consumers suddenly go, Wait, that is what I want. <laughs> They do. They are very good at that. Yeah. Two days there. Uh, AMC's Walking Dead named Cable's top-rated script drama. Congratulations. Now, I was surprised by this because we've obviously seen a lot of... When you say top-rated, you mean most viewed or, or most beloved or what? 6.6 .6 million viewers in the crucial 18 to 49 age demographic. Uh, so viewers being the number of people who sat there and watched the show with their own eyes. So, and, and by the way, it's what's funny is uh, my question I was about to ask you, I'm looking at this article right now, and it is the first comment on here. If you scroll down, it's uh, John Wilde says, highest rated and biggest disappointments. I hope the first half of the season was a result of the transition. Like, this is my big question, because obviously there, the, the first season was so beloved by critics and beloved by fans and beloved by, by you know, AMC for making it a mint. Uh, in the second season, obviously, had had a lot of problems, some of which were related to the transition, some of which related to it, it not being certain things that fans were expecting. Um, are, I'm shocked by this, that it, that, that it still is making money hand over fist. I guess, what do you feel? I, I think a lot, it may be uh, the highest rated because as much as everyone complained, we kept watching it because we loved it so much that first season. We just couldn't believe it was going to stay bad, and it didn't. It got better. So I, I, I think it didn't, it didn't blow people off yet. But the second half of the season is going to have to be stellar or people yeah. will give up. They're so burned from, from slogging through the first half that now that you've given them a break, when it comes back in February, they're, they're going to watch that first episode and it better capture them. Or a lot of people are going to be like, I, I give up. I can't, I can't waste my time on this. I, I tell you what, it's kind of a good thing that we've had the Lost experience. Because you remember how rough the second season of Lost was. And, and in, indeed, for me, the experience of the second season of Battlestar Galactica was the same thing. Whereas I loved the first season, maybe more than any other series I'd ever seen. Second season, it was almost as though I could hear the writers say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's slow things down around here. Maybe some side quests. What do you say, guys? And, uh, and as a result, I hated it. So I, I think there's plenty of precedent for shows kind of veering off course, but eventually finding their stride again. And I hope that's what happens with this one. Now, uh, one thing that's having a problem right now is Xbox Live Dashboard. Again, I can't, for some reason, I don't know why. I have no internet access suddenly. Uh, but if you go to twitter.com slash Major Nelson, you can tell me whether Xbox new dashboard has actually launched. It was supposed to launch at 7 a.m. this morning. As of the recording of Tech News Today earlier this afternoon, it had not launched yet. Yeah. It was still being delayed. Uh, and it looks like it finally launched. Major Nelson says, if you got the Xbox update, let us know what you think. Uh, Good. Sorry for the launch delay. First set of customers will be getting the Xbox Live update within the next few hours. So what you get with this is a bunch of interface changes that look in that Metro style. You get improvements to the Connect interface, so it's, it supposedly works better with both hand motions and the ability to say uh, Xbox, Bing for search. Uh, why didn't they just say search? But okay, Xbox, <laughs> Bing, Bing and then you search. say the name of a show and it just finds it for you.
Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. And the question is now, obviously, I think we've we've uh, those of us who have been playing with Siri on the iPhone 4s is have kind of a new standard of expectations for natural language inter interaction. Uh, I wonder. If, I will be very impressed, and I'm very hopeful that the Xbox is able to bring a Siri-like interface because that would be freaking rad. And and there's tons of other updates coming with this dashboard related to gaming, relating to other things, but focusing on the video aspect since this is frame rate. This is the cord cutting show, uh, you're going to get, with the dashboard update today, Epics in the United States, uh, ESPN on Xbox Live, so an improvement on ESPN 360, Hulu Japan, Hulu Plus in the United States, Love Film in the United Kingdom, an improved Netflix interface uh, here in the United States, Premium Play in Italy, SkyGo in Austria and Germany, Telefonica España in movie st and uh, movie star in Mahenio in Spain, and the Today Show in the United States. And there's tons more coming later in September in early 2012. Things like the BBC, things like HBO Go coming in early 2012. Uh, the MSN coming to a bunch of different countries later in December. Crackle, Daily Motion coming later in December. So they're trying to be that video hub. And they're trying to use Connect to be that thing where you just talk to the television and tell it what you want to watch and it finds it for you. Uh, it's not going to launch with Verizon at Fios TV until later in December. Remember, you're going to get 28 channels on Verizon Fios. It's not launching with YouTube until later in December, and it's not launching with Comcast On Demand until later as well. Talking uh, about YouTube, are we able to jump? Oh, we should talk about what we're watching first, or did you want to cover this Breaking Bad story? Oh, yeah, we could just mention it. Go to io9, read about the, the real-life Breaking Bad teacher uh, in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, but not Breaking Bad because she was apparently cooking where she ate in her home, but, <laughs> but busted for cooking meth with her son in the house. Yes! So check that out. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at what we're watching. watching what are you watching brian uh you know what actually this week i've watched nothing but the rankin bass uh frosty the snowman and uh rudolph the Rand nosed reindeer stop motion animation movies uh but i did there was a bunch of stuff i saw over the last holiday break over the um uh, when i was at my in-laws i watched uh, live television which i never do um we uh i finally checked out uh i watched modern family again and again it's good but but I, and I don't know if I'm that guy who already you know experienced you know feels partial to the whole Arrested Development situation and uh, and can't love anyone else because of it. Of course, we talked about the Muppets. I did watch Larry Crown, which uh, which you said you watched. That was your big movie from or what? Oh, I never watched it. I just had it in the movie draft. Oh, really? No, yeah. it was adorable. It was it was very charming, and it's very. There's something adorable about knowing that the movie is completely Tom Hanks's baby. Tom well, I think Hanks. Larry Crown was the one that I bought the tickets but didn't go. Oh, really? <laughs> so I wanted to push their seats. <laughs> no, it's, it's worth watching. It's worth watching. It was on uh, video video on demand. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a cute little movie with Julia Roberts. And and somehow it's made cuter knowing that that I believe he directed it or a certain, it's a Playtone movie. It's one, of, it's one of his projects. And knowing that he was putting his heart into it made it it's something different. Um, I, I also watched Suburgatory, uh, which I'd never seen before and, and did not care for. It was so... So New York elitist and like, aren't you a dork if you live in the suburbs? I'm like, well, you know what? Screw you. I do live in the suburbs, and it's awesome. And I am uh, a dork. Yes, and I am a dork, totally. Uh, although it is, you know, of course, it's got, uh, you know, Wash from Firefly on there. And, uh, oh, that's, that's cool. Is he uh, evil? Wait, wait, He's been evil uh, in a lot of his parts recently. No, no, no. He's just petty. He's it's just petty. petty. Okay. So he's gone <laughs> back from being evil to, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, oh, and then I I finally watched with my daughter. This is what's great about having a seven year old daughter is finding yourself trying to be a model of of watching what you want them to be into. And somehow my daughter has gotten totally into uh, uh, into the universe with Stephen Hawking. We're totally totally enjoying it. Watch more of those. I uh, watched Downton Abbey on Netflix this weekend uh, after many, many recommendations. It's a masterpiece. Uh, it's masterpiece classic, not masterpiece theater, but whatever. Fantastic. Uh, really? This is absolutely worth watching. Now, it's a little bit colored by my love of this era of British history. It takes place in 1912. You know, it's the declining aristocracy. It's If you like things like Jeeves and Wooster and that whole thing, you, you're going to love it. Uh, but... It starts with the uh, wreck of the Titanic. Oh, awesome. And, and two members of the family, you know, spoiler, spoiler alert, blue here, but, you know, two members of the family are lost 
in the Titanic and uh, the inheritance of the entire estate is entailed to them, which means that all of the money of his American wife and Downton Abbey that he lives in now goes to the third cousin who is a lawyer in Manchester. He has oh, a job. Yeah. Anyway, it goes on from there. Uh, so well written, so well done. Really given from the perspective of the servants more than the, the rich people, which gives you a, a, a different look at this stuff. I guess it's a modern upstairs, downstairs. But so many people have told me how great it was. And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I like that kind of thing. I'll watch it. Once you watch it, you get so sucked into the writing. Uh, where, where, can I, where can I see it? Is it online? It is on Netflix, season one. Uh, season two has aired in the BBC, but is not available anywhere legally in the United States. It's coming to PBS in January, but you can watch all of season one on Netflix. Oh, speaking of Netflix, uh, somebody pointed out on Twitter today, I think it was uh, Logan Decker over at PC Gamer Magazine, mentioned that uh, Spaced was was on Netflix. And I had never seen Spaced. Of course, I had heard about it. I know, familiar with uh, Edgar Wright's awesome stuff along with Simon Pegg. Uh, and so I finally watched the first episode and... Our first episode didn't strike me, and I can't tell if it's because it's 12 years old now and what seemed revolutionary at the time mm. wasn't, you know, really, really poking at me. But I don't feel a strong affinity for the characters yet, and I, and I find the novelty of the surreality of it more um, as an obstacle to me really enjoying and getting to know the characters more than a, uh, you know, a novel benefit that makes it a fun show for me. I've been, I, I, one of the reasons I watched Downton Abbey this weekend is I've pretty much given up on almost all the fall shows. Uh, really? I, yeah. I just, and, you know, we're getting into that point where a lot of them are on hiatus for the, for the break, holiday break anyway. Uh, but, yeah, I've given up on a lot of them. And, and, and so I, I have a lot of free time. I'm not catching up on anything. Uh, I did watch Neverland. The, the, the sci-fi movie. Every year, sci-fi does one really good movie around Shark, the holidays. Octa Shark. Wait, what no, was No, no, no. They, they do those most of the rest of the year. But every year around December, they do like Alice or Red or one of these that like, take a classic fairy tale and really get good actors uh, and put some budget behind it and make a really good movie. And Neverland, I thought, was really enjoyable. It's a prequel to the Peter Pan story. Oh, uh, that's so it's how... Peter and Hook end up in Neverland. Uh, so it's got Anna it, it, Friel from Pushing Daisies in the uh, in the, uh, uh, the 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 captain of the pirate ship role. She's fantastic. Uh, it's got a lot of, a lot of other good names in it. Good acting, good production value. I liked the story. So totally. So this one this one is the Star Wars. The beloved Disney franchise is The Empire Strikes Back, and then Hook is the Return of the Jedi. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, also, and we should mention tonight on uh, Sci-Fi, so it may be too late for you, uh, are the holiday specials that they do every year for all of their main shows. So Eureka, uh, uh, ha Haven, and Warehouse 13 all get holiday treatments tonight. So you get a special episode that's sort of, sort of out outside of the timeline of the normal shows, but you get to watch some shows that you don't usually get to watch because they're on in the summer. Right on? Yeah. So good job, uh, Sci-Fi. Let's move on to Interfera. In Switzerland, they do things differently. Obviously, you know about Swiss banks and, the, and all of the tax implications of that because you're all incredibly wealthy. But one of the things you may not know is that it is legal for you to download copyrighted video and music for your own purposes, as long as you don't make money off of it. Swiss government recently reviewed this because, as you can imagine, the industry probably doesn't really like this, found that, in fact... Repressive anti-piracy laws don't seem to actually lead to more money being made. Uh, according to the report, $12 million was spent on Hadopi in France. That's their three strikes law, a uh, figure the Swiss deemed too high. Uh, they found that it is questionable whether a three strikes law would be legal in the first place, considering the UN Human Rights Council has labeled Internet access a human right. And they also found that people who downloaded copyrighted material over the Internet were more likely to spend more money on actual copyrighted material in the long run. Uh, than people who didn't. And so they saw no need to change their law because it did not seem to be having an adverse financial impact on the industry. 
I loved the quote that Corey wrote where he said, it's a rare victory for evidence-based policy in a world dominated by shrill assertions of lost jobs and revenue. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, the report states that around a third of Swiss citizens over 15 years old downloaded pirated music, movies, and games from the Internet. However, these people don't spend less money as a result because the budgets they reserve for entertainment are fairly constant. That means more, that downloading is mostly complimentary. Uh, and then the other side of piracy is that downloaders are reported to be more frequent visitors to concerts. Game downloaders actually bought more games than those who didn't, and in the music industry, lesser-known bands profit most from the sampling effect of file sharing. And especially, uh, you know, take it back a decade to, uh, you know, the, the loudest people crying about uh, internet piracy or internet piracy of music back in the day was Metallica. Metallica, of course, as is in in line with this study, they derived a lot of their success from bootlegs of their concert uh, audio tapes. So uh, hopefully, hopefully this means that we'll get a more sensible policy in the future. I don't know. Question mark. No, we won't. But it just means that the, that Switzerland will remain an outlier and show some sense. Uh, not not for a while will we get some more sensible policy around this. But it is one of those, as Cory Doctorow says, it's one of those rare moments where someone actually looked at the numbers and said, you know what? We're not losing this much money to piracy. The amount of money spent on entertainment is fairly consistent. So when I go and I download something for free, it doesn't mean I save that money. It means that I take that money and I spend it on some other kind of entertainment. So laws that actually favor a certain industry are only propping up that industry. They're not changing how much money is spent on entertainment as a whole. And I think that's a really Here's good point. Here's the funny part, too, is because the people who actually create the content, they understand that what they're trying to do is manufacture a virus that infects people and makes them want to hear more of the story. Because, like, for, for example, for us, our job is to make each episode of Frame Rate so engaging, so frustrating, so enticing that, that people just want to hear more of whatever story it is we have to, set, to, to, to say. Now, on the flip side, uh, it's the content owners... Uh, let's imagine a scenario where, you know, it, it's not Twit, but some evil corporation that, that uh, owns the content. They're the ones who be like, well, I've got this special gem and I'll be damned if anyone will look at my gem without giving me a fee. And, uh, and meanwhile, we're like, no, no, please, everyone look at our gem. Because the more of you look at it, the more of you that will ask us to, to cut fine gems like this in the future. So, uh, you know, maybe this is a case where the middleman gets squeezed, but that, that, it seems like we could just win more in the long run. If we have more people who are, have access to, to, I don't know, fall victim to more awesome stories. Well, I think that the straw man that the Swiss report calls attention to is there is no winning more. There is a budget that people spend right. on entertainment. Right. And it's how it gets split up that's at issue. And government has no business in weighing in and deciding who gets to have a bigger slice or not of that amount. As long as the money is going into the industry and creativity is being fostered and rewarded, that's all that matters. They determined that that's what's happening. We don't need to change the law. Absolutely. Absolutely. YouTube has changed their homepage to be more channel-oriented. If you go to YouTube.com, you'll notice this. Not only are uh, there channels for creations, but there's all, you'll also see a lot of recommendations of different things to watch based on who you're friends with and who you subscribe to. All right. So if you don't All subscribe right. to anybody like right. we don't on our on our demo machine, you don't see anything, <laughs> apparently. You know, That's kind funny? of a problem, isn't yeah. it? That's I true. would show you what I'm subscribed to, but I'm afraid of being made fun for it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold my thumb out here. I want to hear your vote before I show you mine. Thumbs up or thumbs down. On Jason, the new do you have my no. screen? I'll, I'll, I can use mine, too. Uh, well, oh, except I don't have no, internet yeah, access. Yeah, I don't so. have yours. Oh, man, you're going to make me show mine. You know, I have internet access. What's going on? I don't have web access because I have the chat room. Oh, that's weird. That's a separate problem. But yes, thumbs up. I want to see Brian. All right, so here we go. So this is, uh, there we go. We got, uh, now I am absolutely in love with this. I love what it does, mainly for one thing, and that's because I've never bothered to set up all my channels in YouTube, but because it now is tied with my Google Plus account, all of a sudden it's got all the Twitch shows right on there. It's got, it's got Colleen posting stuff. Uh, host of Skepticality, Derek Colanduno posts a video, it shows up. All of a sudden, it's like an aggregated, this is all stuff that I might have missed inside my regular uh, Google Plus perusing. But instead, like I'm just like, oh, that's right. I totally, it's been forever since I've watched an awesome Spill.com review. Uh, I absolutely love it. And I love, uh, I love the way it makes it feel like a channel because I got all my channels right here to check out for all these different things. For example, yeah, all kinds yeah, of stuff. Look at that. Check, I, mine is working in Opera. 
not in Firefox, so it's not an internet problem. Oh. But uh, if you have mine, you can go ahead and show it, Jason. Uh, from the chat room, Beef says, I noticed Scam School care. Brian didn't connect Facebook. Neither did I. I'm guessing most people didn't. Did you Did you bother to connect your Facebook? No. I yeah, did not. I won't because, because most of my input, like I can't imagine anyone I would get input from on Facebook that I don't already get from my Google Pluses or from my specific YouTube channels. Uh, finally, uh, there's a story from All Things D about Shira Lazar's What's Trending show and her reported numbers since she got booted off of CBS Interactive. Uh, CBS.com got rid of her after there was controversy over a misreporting on Twitter about the death of Steve Jobs back when he was still alive. Uh, and uh, that ended up uh, causing her to go independent. And she says the traffic has gone up. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I guess this is to be expected. Would, would you have predicted that, or when you uh, are you surprised by this result? I am a little surprised. Uh, you know, I, I, CBS has a pretty good footprint. If you look at the Nielsen ratings, they're a top 10 uh, web property. Now, CBS.com is only a section of that. You know, that, that counts everything that they own. But uh, I, I think what it does show is that having your name in front of people is invaluable that all press is good press sort of situation yeah, and, and i think it probably uh i don't know if it vindicates is the right word but it shows that people do like Sheryl lazar and they like her show enough that they'll forgive uh that misstep as bad as it was and keep watching the show that that's that bygones be bygones yeah i agree i think that's a good way to put it all right, let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. All right, we're short on time here, but uh, Derek is an industry insider who uh, loved the show so much he couldn't even stop. We've watching. had Derek on the show, Derek Chen. Uh, oh, is that, is that the same Derek? Yep. Okay, all right. Well, uh, he piped in with a few thoughts about Hulu and the targeted advertising. I didn't realize it was the same Derek. I'm sorry, Derek. Uh, it says, number one, it's not necessarily more targeted, talking about advertisements on Hulu. Now, uh, what I had said was that, you know, you have the opportunity to buy highly targeted ads, and he's saying they're not targeted. Uh, my, my, my point, I hope, still stands because whether or not it is targeted, it can be because you have so many demographics. You have such a wealth of information. Uh, for the big guys on t uh, big buys on TV, they can select specific shows they want to buy spots on. Hulu sells everything in bulk categories and prohibits cherry picking specific shows. Their position is that they sell it by audience or genre, but at the end, it can be uh, just as untargeted as TV. In, uh, second point in the ad world, first run is still a big deal. Live tune-ins has actually regained strength, and a lot of it due to social media, as people watch the show as it first airs. And now, with certain networks pushing for eight-day delays for unauthenticated accounts. Others have, like FX, have 30-day delay. Hulu loses some of that shine. Tracking, the tracking is pretty much standard fare for what is normally done online. There isn't any rich media to the extent of management really relies on a click, or in some cases, the selection of an ad over others. Furthermore, video destinations usually like to push away from being held to any metrics, and even sometimes play the TV card that makes it more of a branding experience. Uh, price efficiency, as video continues to grow in popularity, online video is actually getting more and more expensive. The scary thing is that online video CPMs have actually risen to become at times similar or even above TV CPMs, even for branding campaigns. To Brian's point about ROI, video, online or TV, isn't really the prime place for direct response type campaigns. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming everything you say is 100% right. I will say it should be. Rob Maxwell at Damascus, Maryland says, on your last show, you talked about checking out both Amazon live streaming and iTunes for content since there are sometimes better prices to be had on one or the other. And of course, not all content is in both places. Do you know of any search engines or apps that will help me find the content I want on the various video offerings out there, including Hulu and the others as well. Maybe with pricing info, I already know where to look for torrents. Uh, thanks. We, talk, we talked about this earlier. Sidereel is a fantastic place. S-I-D-E-R-E-E-L.com. Uh, R-E-E-L, not R-E-A-L. And uh, Clicker is another good one. And they'll, uh, they'll all have links. I don't think they'll list the prices for you right there. We were talking about music. Uh, too. And I, I wish there was a good music search engine like that. And maybe there is, and, and somebody can uh, send us an email about it. Right on.
I guess that's it, man. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate. I can't believe we're already over. That was a fast one. Frame Rate Show at gmail.com is the email address. If you have suggestions or comments, please email us and let us know. Uh, we will be on our normal time next week, but the week after that, we're going to have to be at a different time because the Twit Holiday Special will be in our slot on December 21st. So we'll let you know about that. See you next time.